Welcome. Thank you very much for all coming on this beautiful afternoon. And uh, we're going to give you a rundown of city planning in Lake Forest, uh, 151, two years of it, uh, over 150 years of it, um, that's been going on. And, we're, and uh, Gail Hodges and I are going to t take you on this romp through this history. Uh, mine is going to be shorter because some of it is more familiar. It's the first 75 years, but I'm not going to do a minute a year, so don't worry. Um, but, but reminding you of some things, and, and my, uh, my, my things are simple. These are some extra uh, handouts which I'm going to send around, which is the invitation. And because I'm going to talk about the city map, which everybody knows. Um, the City of Lake Forest original map uh, from 1857. But I just want to re reiterate for everybody what actually was implied by that map about the planning of the, uh, of the early community. The, the city of Lake Forest had um, its start in a Lake Forest Association in the city of Chicago. The, the people um, wanted to start a community. They looked around in different areas where the railroad tracks went. Um, they were Scotch and New Englanders united as in, the, in the Presbyterian Church at that time, both of them. Very clannish groups, both of them. Um, and were liking to be on their own by themselves. Uh, they also both came from kind of places where there was irregular terrain. And the, and the, the terrain in Chicago was only irregular when you step in a mud puddle um, in those <laughs> days. So it, um, it was, uh, this time of year would have been not a good time in Chicago in those days. So here you had irregular terrain. And that was one of the things that attracted them. Um, we don't know one of the most important parts of what it is. We know that the people were inclined in a certain direction to be very forward and moving things, but they actually registered their plan for the city of Lake Forest um, in July of 1857. F.L. Olmsted got his first gig at Central Park in September of 1857. So um, the landscape architect that they chose here was a cemetery planner who'd been out east in Brooklyn at the uh, Greenwood Cemetery there, uh, made a major expansion there, um, and then gone to St. Louis. And the closest landscape architect was on that scale for a town scale was uh, at St. Louis. He, um, and, and so came to set up the, th the plan here. Earlier plans, there was a somewhat similar plan outside of Cincinnati, which a lot of the Presbyterians, the New England Presbyterians had roots in Cincinnati. And there had been a, a, pl a plan for a similar, uh, but much smaller little thing uh, overlooking New York City in uh, the Orange, New Jersey area on a high ridge. But nothing where it was it planned as an entire town. Um, what was interesting was this was a, a, an effort to make a town that was both an educational thing and also a, um, a residential thing. Um, and if you've seen the plans, you've noticed that there's about 300 lots. Um, about the size of a typical New England congregation uh, size. Um, they were lots that were larger. Uh, they were maybe from one and a half, if you were closer into the railroad tracks um, along Westminster and Deer Path, closer in, to two to four acres further out, uh, closer to the lake and at, at more of the extremes. But they were substantial lots. These were not tiny lots. The, the ones that were in the sort of um, three to four acres were very much like the lots on the north side of Chicago, the individual blocks. Every one of those individual blocks originally had a house in the middle of it and then kind of a landscape around it. And if you go by Lake Forest College and you notice the house that was the Holt House on um, the corner of College Road, it's the northwest corner of College and Sheridan, that's very much the scale that was originally envisioned for that sort of a thing, to sit in a high point. Um, and so these were lots that were planned to have a house on a high point, um, that they would have, one of the things that was a little bit edgy in the plan was that they would have the streets sort of surf across the ravines. Um, this was very easy to lay out for the man from St. Louis who was gonna go home again. Um, but for the people who bought the lots, they, they had a few moments um, when they shared their concerns with the uh, people developing the town because they couldn't get to their property yet because there were no bridges. And in fact, the streets had these big um, 
tree trunks in them and everything. So it took a while to realize everything like that was, it was developing, but it was very carefully arranged to be these, these maybe as many as 300 different estate kind of properties. There was no central business district in the town. It was a college and men's school and women's school were the centers of the community. Businesses were um, sent west of the railroad tracks. The community was almost a closed or gated community. Um, it, 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 one or two streets were coming together at the depot and otherwise they all focused up toward that depot. Um, the businesses were supposed to be along what was originally was now called McKinley Road and there were actually two businesses originally. One that was a little general store which had a place for <coughs> town meetings above it by 1860 or so and then um, another shoe repair guy next to the railroad tracks. So imagine they were walking a bit. Sounds good. Um, across the tracks there wasn't anything yet. There was um, a farm. The Anderson family got a farm in exchange for um, for clearing some of the streets. And uh, that farm uh, lasted into the um, Lake Forest Improvement Trust in the, in the teens and then I think that uh, then it went to the Northern Trust after that was dissolved in the 80s. Uh, so as people still are receiving income from that original farm that was exchanged for getting tree trunks out of the, the streets. So invest your money well, you never know. Um, smart move. Um, so th the businesses, Mr. Holt, who was one of these New England sort of no-nonsense type guys, said he wouldn't build his house on the corner of College Road and um, Sheridan if there were any businesses on this side of the tracks. So then, as the, after the Civil War, they actually moved those businesses to the other side of the tracks, to the Western Avenue side of the tracks. So Western Avenue meant beyond the tracks. Uh, it was the other part, and that was where the business community was. Um, and everything in this in interior part didn't have businesses in it. So it was a very early idea of zoning from the idea of the planner on the one hand, and also from the people who were the leaders of the community wanting to make sure that it was kept um, not, um, that, that it was kept the way they wanted to have it. Uh, no businesses. Um, so when we look at the roots of why Costco isn't in Lake Forest, <laughs> I mean seriously, you can go back to the very earliest instincts of the people in the community. They didn't want those businesses here. Um, and so it's kind of hardwired into the way we think about things. Now, um, went along, developed the big, the first big change that came was in the 1890s to the community when um, Henry Ives Cobb from 1890 to 1893 built a big, the biggest house in town on a farm south of Deer Path on Green Bay Road. Um, like a, you know, good advanced thinking architect, he th perhaps th someone will want to buy this at some point. So a few years later, the Inwensia Club, golf had taken off big from 1892 to 93. They were actually playing over by uh, the day school grounds in 1894, the Lake Forest Golf Club, renamed themselves Inwensia, took over that farm, brought some Scots guys from Old Tom Morris's shop in St. Andrews to then uh, work on laying out the, the Inwensia grounds, the Foolis family. Um, they were the people who originally did it. And the first uh, pro was, had been trained as one of the people at, at Old Tom Morris's shop. So that changed things in the 1890s. Pretty soon there were estates creeping along Green Bay Road up and down. Um, Cobb built the beginning ones of them, then Shaw later. Um, this was a great, um, actually a sandbar. And what you had then, fox hunting get started and they would fox hunt out, out west across the the regions toward the uh, Des Plaines River. Um, and the farmers weren't always totally enamored of this process. So they, it became expedient to buy the farms from the farmers and then you wouldn't have people complaining about running through their fields. So uh, gradually then the town went out that way and, and it developed, so you had the original development of the smaller estates that were maybe three or four acres in size. Um, and then it leapfrogged over uh, to Green Bay Road and West, and then you had bigger estates being developed by, uh, within the first 10 years of that. So um, what that created was a very interesting situation. You had a sandwich of a smaller estates in East Lake Forest, bigger estates in West Lake Forest, and 
something nobody had ever paid any attention to in between um, Western Avenue to, um, to Green Bay Road. Nobody, nobody cared. They never went there. Um, their, their people went and shopped there some, but they didn't go there. All of a sudden, they were driving through it to get to the Inuensia Club, and they thought it should be improved. There was also a wonderful livery stable right across, very logically, from the train station. Um, it had this great big barn. It had a restaurant. It had catering, everything. But there was a certain amount of olfactorily challenging um, something, a je ne sais quoi, that hit you when you got off the train. And so they thought that perhaps it was good to redevelop the downtown. And so after a few attempts, there was a Blackler building, 1895, perhaps built by Pond and Pond, um, which is now where Third, Fifth, Fifth Third Bank is. And um, then in 1903, the Walgreens building, which was the Anderson Trust, uh, was built. Uh, City Hall, 1899, uh, for the exact amount of money that the uh, North Shoreline paid to run their tracks through Lake Forest, um, $10,000. Um, so these buildings were beginning to be a context for developing the downtown. Uh, so in the railroad station, 1900, um, very handsome railroad station, contributed to by people in the community uh, to look nice and to be good for their, their horse shows. It started in 1900 and continued until 1970. So the, um, the tracks were um, still kind of a dividing line among the parts of the community and so was Green Bay Road. Uh, Market Square was developed, uh, the land was purchased, and the um, delivery stable was moved in 1912. Uh, they didn't actually put everything together and start building it until 1915, and it was completed in late 1916, very beginning of 1917, Market Square was completed. So they were trying to clean up that area. Uh, also in 1907, they had developed uh, an estate support community around the West Park area and uh, that was to have middle-class housing in town. Uh, so that was the setup. Another thing that happened in 1913 was the income tax, which had been declared unconstitutional in 1872, um, reared its ugly head again. Um, the Republicans ran two candidates, and the Democrat, uh, Woodrow Wilson, won, and uh, ta -da, there was a new income tax. Um, things changed, and so by, it, it, it was a re, I guess we'd call it, what would people call it today, a redistribution of income. But you began to have more middle class people by the 20s. Um, and so in Chicago, there were great things going on with the plan. Uh, there was a young guy who joined the Inwensi Club in 1907, Edward Bennett, uh, married in 1912, um, daughter of, of uh, David B. Jones, who lived uh, just to the um, north of the Inwensia Club at the corner of Deer Path and Green Bay Road. This is Bennett in the 20s or early 30s when he was working on uh, Grant Park and things like that. And he was also heavily involved in Lake Forest. Um, he built his own home, 1916, on the north, I'm sorry, on the southwest corner of Green Bay Road and Deer Path uh, on part of the Jones property. Um, had married Catherine Jones in 1912. And so um, he was part of the town here. He advised on Market Square. Um, and also the city began to, as the 20s started, first there was a depression after World War I. Uh, they had four different things to shrink the money supply, um, sort of the opposite of what we're doing today. Um, and the economy just sank like a stone. It didn't revive until 22 or 23, something like that, 24. The building didn't really get started. But the city of Chicago and the city of Lake Forest, both in 1923, adopted new um, ordinances for zoning, for clustering um, businesses and different kinds of housing. Uh, as they went west from where they were, and as neighborhoods were growing up even on the east side of the tracks for, with smaller lots than the original kind of lots, and there was more subdivision going on, they decided to do that clustering. So the city had a very canny Scot named um, uh, James King, who was, had been written the first ordinances up in the 1890s and was here, later lived in, in West Park. He quickly um, decided that they would outsource everything to this guy who lived right near the city hall, Edward Bennett. And so Bennett's firm was the Lake Forest Planning Department from the early 20s uh, through that period of growth. 
Um, they, re, they, they put in an original zoning thing, but they showed some businesses down nearby where the day school is now. They revised those a year or so later, a couple years later, to have them all clustered around the downtown. So we think of the downtown and some of the neighborhoods that have smaller lots near bigger lot neighborhoods as just kind of happening accidentally. It was actually very carefully planned at that time. Uh, so the Woodland Road, Edgewood Road, uh, Griffith Road neighborhoods, those were all being carefully laid out for different kinds of uses and purposes. Um, Edward Bennett's firm was in charge of that. There was a fellow named Frost who worked with him, and there's a lot of co correspondence of, of them down at the Art Institute on microfilm that you can see there um, of basically the city's doing all of its business corresponding that way. Uh, they also moved 50 feet to the east, McKinley Avenue, uh, north of the, the um, Chicago Northwestern Railroad Station, the metro station. To, and so they had to pick up and move all the houses, and this was outsourced also. The planning for that was outsourced. I think they wanted to take a jog out of the roadway or something. And so they did that all with um, the planning being done by, the, by the, the Bennett firm down in the city. 1929, there was another plan produced uh, in addition to the one in 1923 for the zoning. And this one actually created a plan commission because they saw that they couldn't um, just keep doing it ad hoc um, tinkering with what they'd set up originally. So they set up a, an actual plan commission to deal with these subdivision needs and, um, and, and changes and, and extrapolation of their ideas to other parts of Lake Forest in uh, 1929. And so that's when uh, the city then um, became modern. In 1929, there was also a sort of uh, crash. We don't know about those anymore, but they used to have them. And, um, <laughs> used to have crashes, they were very serious. Um, and then again, they didn't have uh, some of the techniques that we have available now to help correct it, but um, the building slowed down considerably for a while and it wasn't until the late 30s, but there was the first chair of the plan commission was Edward Bennett from 29 to 34. Um, and there were several other names that I'm trying to remember, but people like Hamill and um, A.B. Dick and, and major people who had major estates in town were the people who were on the plan commission. So that brings us up to almost modern times, the first 75 years, and uh, I will turn things over to Gail Hodges. I don't have so many juicy morsels as Art does, but I'm also not going to bore you with a lot of technical details. But I thought it's important as we look at Lake Forest City planning, I thought it's important to just, we'll backtrack a little bit, but we're really looking at ordinances that have occurred since we had our zoning ordinance. Typically we think of Lake Forest in terms of market square, that's a standard photograph. I chose this landscape, streetscape on Lake Road to emphasize the fact that all of our planning comes from that first landscape plan that Art talked about, and that everything we have done from that time, which earns us names such as the City in a Park or Tree City USA, comes from that landscape plan, from a dominance of landscape over the built environment. We, have, we are one of the earliest planned communities in the nation. We're looking at that little map again. And planning in the spirit of the original plan continues to this day. There are several characteristics that are important to remember. The planning is always in an atmosphere of respectful of landscape, both natural and design, respectful of the visual character of the built environment, both historic and more recent, and also of neighborhoods and business districts, respectful neighbor to neighbor. Our ordinances are designed to emphasize respect and preservation. Because since the beginning, Lake Forest has demonstrated a willingness to adopt innovative planning techniques to proactively shape its community. People in this community have cared enough about what was first here in the way of the land and later in the way of architectural gems to be able to make the extra special effort to preserve those and to not say, have an attitude of we're going to use up the land and fill it up with as much as we can, but we're going to treasure this very fragile atmosphere that we have of unique landscaping and unique architecture. What has made this a relatively seamless transition from the Hotchkiss landscape plan that the founders saw, or several of, that the founders um, commissioned, 
are several instances. And we're not going to go over every ordinance the city has, but basically the two major fat, uh, elements are the zoning code and the building code. Within the zoning code, the historic preservation ordinance, which we've only had in recent years, is critically important. Within the building code, there are several ordinances and guidelines that support that. Primarily, the architecture and design review ordinance, which established the building review board. We have residential design guidelines that are specific and a wonderful asset for both our citizens and for our boards. We have a building scale and environment ordinance, which is designed to protect the balance between landscape and built environment. And a tree preservation and landscape ordinance, which really gets at what's important in our, um, in our uh, treasured landscape. As Art has mentioned, Lake Forest was one of the first communities in the state to have a zoning ordinance and actually in the nation. We were also one of the first communities in the state to have a subdivision ordinance. Look at some of the overall goals of our ordinances. We want to achieve development that's consistent with the comprehensive plan, which is our overall plan for how we want the community to develop. We had our first comprehensive plan uh, in 1955 in response to World War II development pressures. Lake Forest, in a way, not quite like a place like Charleston where they couldn't afford to do anything after the Civil War, but in a way because we were out further from the city, we had a little cushion after World War II. There was slow but steady growth in that period from, say, well, pre-World War II to about 1955, from about 1935. There were some subdivision of estates, but there was also just very quiet development. However, um, we have consistently revised the, the comprehensive plan. Uh, there was a major uh, revision in 1978, and subsequently there have been more. The overall goals in all of this is to ensure development that preserves and enhances the economic value of Lake Forest. The preservation ordinance has several goals. Summarized here to preserve and enhance the city's historic architectural and landscape resources, to encourage development that's respectful of the city's built and environmental heritage, to foster civic pride. There are not many places where as recently people would be asked to write in and say what I love about Lake Forest and have hundreds of responses and also to ensure the future economic value of Lake Forest by protecting the city's uniqueness. The preservation ordinance is strengthened by several factors. We have three national register districts here. Uh, that's the highest honor that can be given to a place of historic significance. We have seven properties that are individually listed on the national register which again is the highest honor that can be achieved by a property of distinction on a national basis. And we have at this point over 25 designated landmarks. If you go to the city's website under the community development area, there are a number of wonderful resources there. And one thing that you can pick up if you look at the historic preservation ordinance is you can find out what all the designated landmarks are and where all these wonderful places are that are our particular treasures in the community. There are also, within the historic preservation ordinance, is something that is very important, and that is that there are general and specific standards for review of applications. Anyone with a property within the historic um, district comes before this board so that they can either get a certificate of appropriateness for what they propose or a certificate of hardship in case there's a special problem with their petition. That's different from the um, building review board. Architectural and design review, which is the area um, where the building review board uh, is uh, authorized, has a specific goal, and this is a direct quote from the ordinance. Each building in Lake Forest shall complement and improve upon the architectural heritage of the city. That reflects an attitude. It reflects a history that's very important here. The ordinance um, sets standards for the kinds of plans that people must submit to the city. It establishes the building review board and what those members 
um, qualifications must be and what their authority is. And it also provides for architectural design review following specific standards. The Building Review Board reviews petitions that require exceptions for residential and business petitions, as well as matters such as landscaping and signage and lighting. So there's a, a very large agenda there. They used to consider historic properties also, but since we now have the Preservation Commission, they, those properties are no longer there. And what comes before the Building Review Board are those petitions that require exceptions. Residential design guidelines, I encourage you to go to the city's website and find this document. There is so much here about the history of Lake Forest, about the character of our neighborhoods, about the character of the architects, architecture that is here, and lots of wonderful information. Just as a resource for yourself or if you're interested in history, I would encourage you to go there. The city staff has done a remarkable and very, very thorough job of putting this together, and I think it's a terrific resource for our city. This is the basic resource document for any petitions coming before the Building Review Board or before the Historical Preservation Commission. It defines the character of our neighborhoods, the history and development of Lake Forest, and it sets as its goal that open space, low density, and careful comprehensive planning are to continue to be important to the city and its residents. Also, if you're interested on the city's website, which is cityoflakeforest.com, you can find maps that show all of our zoning, maps that show the locations of all our local landmarks. So if you're interested in this kind of thing, it's again a wonderful resource for your own use. The Building Scale and Environmental Ordinance came about in the late 1980s when it became apparent that land prices, which had escalated, were driving a trend to build larger and larger houses to justify the land cost. As a result, houses that were disproportionately large in relation to the land provided began to overwhelm neighborhoods, began to overwhelm the natural environment in Lake Forest. I was lucky or unfortunate to be on the Building Review Board at that time. And I can remember in the beginning it was very, very hard because we had to keep saying no again and again and again. And it's, I think, reflective of the fact that Lake Forest is willing to take innovative and bold and quite courageous steps sometimes within the law and respectful of people's property rights to ensure that the very fragile place that we have here can continue to be as it has been and yet be enhanced going forward in the, in the future. I put the tree ordinance in here just uh, so people understand a little bit about it if you don't know. Uh, it basically has the goals as specified here. We're trying to preserve the wooded streetscapes of the community, provide for a high level of tree preservation during development and redevelopment. You see all of those orange construction fences around whenever anything is happening the city defines the area that has to be protected on a property that's under construction, and that's what all those are about. And also there is protection for our ravines and bluffs and conservation easements within the community. That makes a huge difference in how the community continues to be a city and a park. It's very interesting, I don't know how many of you ever go on um, uh, the Google Maps site but if you hone in on properties in Lake Forest, for the most part, you can't see the houses because of the trees. And you go to other places and you see cookie cutter subdivisions and almost no trees and whatever. It's, it's very, very illuminating. Those basically are the key ordinances that have kept all of what Art talked about in the beginning together going forward. And it really is, um, this is picked up from something else on the city's website. This was done at the turn of the last century, and it was essentially a little ad for coming to Lake Forest. And it said, never has, um, there, excuse me, nature has layered a world of beauty here. Persons who have traveled the world over are charmed with Lake Forest. 
No place near Chicago presents so many and great encouragements to parents for the education of their children or for a delightful home. Come see the place only one hour from Chicago. On the train, of course. But today, that's what we have here. Um, for over 150 years, I think, or thereabouts, we've been at the forefront of exemplary city planning. Foresight and innovative thinking have helped ensure the sustainability of the very fragile uniqueness of our community and the sustainability of the economic value that's supported by this planning. I think, and this is not the Preservation Foundation's uh, thought, but my own, particularly in times like these, it's very easy to say maybe things are too hard in Lake Forest. We should change it. But I think that people need to, and maybe we'd sell more houses faster, but I think people need to think about the fact that why do people come here? It's because we have a unique environment that we have worked very, very hard to preserve over time. So uh, it's still only an hour from Chicago, and it's a great place. <laughs> Thank you. I think Art or I could take questions if you have any, or you may want to talk among yourselves. Yeah, I have one question. The uh, Landmarks Ordinance in Chicago has been overturned and is now uh, causing many communities in the country to rethink their own the ordinances. Sorry. Maybe the, the question was that the Landmark Ordinance in Chicago has recently been overturned and is causing many communities to rethink their ordinances their landmark ordinances. Um, I'm not really prepared to speak about that, but I do know that ours was established with very, a um, lot of study and a lot of uh, very firm criteria to make it stand up. I think it's a little different than Chicago's. I don't know what you can say. Yeah, well, but that, yeah. the, the last information that I had on it was yeah. that it's under appeal, and it was specific to that particular property, but it's not exactly the way you've seen it Oh. I wish I could remember the details. I got a letter from the law firm on it, and, oh. and I can't remember yeah. all the legalities. But. Thank you, Pauline. Yeah, change. And the Chicago Architectural Foundation is very um, concerned about that. And all you have to do is look at Streeterville and North Michigan Avenue and, and uh, even Central uh, downtown in the Loop. There are many things that have been going on that do not help. Uh, Chicago. Mm -hmm. Don't the aldermen there have a great deal more power uh, over that kind of issue than, fortunately, we're not in that kind of political environment. That's right. yeah. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Or Art, you may want to have some concluding remarks. Oh, Mark Roger. The Preservation Foundation has done a fine job for trying to get the heritage of these communities. But simultaneous to that, has been the work of the Lake Forest Open Lands in preserving open space in town by over 800 acres, how many mm -hmm. tales you would know. Yeah. And that has certainly added to the charm and attraction mm -hmm. of our community. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's very true, and although we can all complain about our taxes, the amount of open space that we have preserved one way or the other in this community actually is very beneficial to our taxes. There have been some very interesting studies done on this, but basically the bottom line is cows in open space don't require schools, they don't require policemen, they don't require fire protection, and on and on we go. So it's uh, actually residential development as much as we like it is more, uh, really never pays for itself on the bottom line in taxes, and there are studies about this. Subdivision that was being proposed, and it, after the discussion and everybody and everything was done very carefully, she did point out that we had just approved at that meeting a new classroom for the city schools in Lake Forest. Um, that there, with every additional development that comes along, there are considerable responsibilities um, for um, all the things that that involves, and so. Keeping that balance in mind, we don't want to have no development, but there have been, but certainly Open Lands has led in helping us see the values of keeping open space. And um, 
it, we think of the great big sweeping open spaces that we have around the, um, the, the east branch of the Skokie and the west branch of the Skokie and Middle Fork, but there are also in East Lake Forest, there are some very small parcels that are under easement that have been protected that provide space between properties. And I think they have a very beneficial effect. And there are tax benefits for people, but there are benefits from all of us who live nearby that we can in enjoy uh, a, a kind of distanced um, pattern of, of housing that's, that's uh, really unmatched elsewhere. So that's certainly a very strong proportion. We have a number of people here today who are uh, on the front lines of making all this happen. And we thank you all for coming and for the work that you do. That's very much appreciated. And uh, we just hope that we can help you in, in any way that, you, that we can to uh, continue with your service. Thank you very much. <laughs>